Um, hello to everyone. Uh, it, it's an honor to be here and to share some of our work with you. I do work in the developing world, um, what has been defined by the UN as low and middle income countries. And I want to share some of that work and, and play in particular parent child, father child and mother child play on child outcomes. So let me progress here. Could you? So my talk will focus on conceptual issues around play and culture. I will uh, share some data on two studies of mother child and father child play on child outcomes in Caribbean and African countries. And I will share some outcomes of a home-based play intervention study in Jamaica. Next slide, please. Okay, so you're very familiar with the UN goals. And when we talk about play, we often ignore the challenges that families and children face in the developing societies. Um, economic constraints, uh, daily challenges um, may prevent them from fully addressing their children's needs uh, in a very stimulating way, uh, what do you even call the positive parenting. And, but nonetheless, we want to end some of these things, uh, poverty, inequality, structural inequality, and more recently, um, systemic racism and injustice across the world. Uh, we also want to imbue in our children a sense of um, stewardship for the environment. And uh, in, in the developing world, a lot of children play outside, and that affects their ability to play floods, disasters, and so on. Um, to realize these goals, I think we have to develop partnerships between the developed world and these developing societies. Often I go to conferences and um, one recently in Trinidad and certain values from other cultural communities are superimposed on developing societies. Next slide, please. Uh, you would all agree that across the world, we have two basic uh, goals in child rearing. We want to engender a sense of agency in children so that they can show potential self-interest in the world, both their cultural world, social world, object world, intellectual world, and so on. But more importantly, we want them to develop a sense of communion, pro-social engagement, cooperation, moral concern for others, where they display empathy, uh, when they look at injustice and inequality. And how we achieve this varies quite a bit across cultures. So I look at cultural developmental pathways to achieve these goals. And they're often tied to beliefs of parents, to practices and goals they have for their children. Uh, for example, our work in the Caribbean suggests that parents have very early developmental goals for children. So they don't emphasize play, they emphasize book learning, reciting the alphabet, and so on. And the long-term goals can be balanced with economic issues versus educational or child training issues. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are new generations of studies um, and they've evolved over the last three decades or so. And we're focusing more on indigenous and cross indigenous perspectives and play. What is particular and what may be similar across cultures? So we need to employ more pan cultural theories that have been tested across cultural communities. I think here is where the play literature needs to, to be developed quite a bit more. Uh, my work in particular focuses on parenting beliefs about play and parenting practice. It is my uh, assumption and my my general hypothesis that play is embedded in warmth and control and other activities that parents engage in with their children. So we can marry these issues together. So if you have warm parenting, then you would have uh, more room to navigate uh, play and engaging uh, play. Next slide, please. So what are some of the conceptual frameworks that I work with? I work within a broad range of um, theoretical conceptual perspectives, uh, in particular psychological anthropology. Here's where we focus on the ethno theories or caretaker knowledge about play. What do we think about play? How important is play to development? How important is play to develop customs and cultural practices that might assist children to 
engage their immediate environment. Uh, the parenting typologies, here's where warmth and, and control comes in. Obviously, parents who are warm and engaging would um, be more likely to foster play. Uh, we've also engaged literacy frameworks where we look at adult engagement in liter literacy type materials. And this is particular to the developing world where parents are engaging children in academic work early, but they're also mixing in play. And of course, you know, the biodevelopmental model, um, it supports the notion that a family are children's first teachers, and this is where a lot of the play occurs early on. Next slide, please. Now I want to, given all the um, issues of social injustice in the U.S. in particular, and um, police brutality, uh, unequal school systems, um, my colleagues have uh, come up with this notion of intentional parenting for equity and justice. And how do we socialize children toward a just and equitable world to play? I think this is a very a ripe area for research and for um, uh, this joins forces with the previous talk. Uh, one mechanism is racial ethnic socialization, where we look at how parents socialize children towards bias. And I think people of color in the US are racialized groups. I've been doing this, doing this quite a bit, and um, it, it has positive benefits, but also there's some um, negative associations. And then this notion of a colorblind approach to play and education, where we socialize our children towards egalitarianism. Oh, sure, if you work hard, the system is fair, you'll make it. And it offers everyone an opportunity. And we know that's not true. One of my doctoral students looked at um, this continuity and continuity between home and school environments among Head Start children. And she found quite a bit of discontinuity in toys, art crafts in home and school environments. And this affected children's behavioral adjustment in the early Head Start programs. So there's this continuity, this continuity hypothesis between different caregiving environments or caregiving and educational environments that present different opportunities to play. And I think we need to address this. Next slide. Please. So across the world, and I've used the individualism, collectivism uh, perspective, and it falls along a continuum, but I, I did use collectivism and individualism. It's not used in a dichotomous sense. There's no society that's truly collectivistic or individualistic. There's a mix of both to varying degrees. And this presents cultures and how their beliefs would play. India, largely collectivistic, changing quite a bit. I don't mean to just um, suggest that all of India is collectivistic, or all families are. So play has often been seen as cursory, cursory childhood development. Hong Kong, you have a mixture. Uh, Jamaica, again, it's a mix of collectivism and individualism. Uh, but they also believe in um, the child obeying and being tidy. And play occurs outside of the classroom or early childhood centers. The Netherlands, individualistic, Mayan, collectivistic, North, South Holland, I, um, I did make variations there. Uh, the US is mainly individualistic, but we have a number of cultural groups that are both collectivistic and individualistic, and so on. And among Latino, Latina families, you see a sociocentric view. Again, they value early academic learning with certain social um, emphasis placed on obedience and collectivism. Okay, so next slide, please. So what I'd like to do against that backdrop is to present two studies on paternal maternal engagement in play and their links to children's cognitive and social development in developing countries. Uh, the first study was published in International Journal of Play two years ago, year and a half ago. And the second study, we're still working in the data. So let me share some of these data with you. Next slide, please. Okay, you know the Caribbean. Um, it's very diverse. It's Francophone. It's uh, Spanish speaking. It's um, Dutch speaking. And it's English speaking. So it's very diverse. People have long oppressive histories of colonialism and domination by other groups. Um, and also loss of cultural practices through the invasion of the cultural psyche of people. Uh, so there's um, 
this tug of war between um, Afrocentric, Indocentric, and other uh, cultural practices, and how that is uh, merged or the bridge to that uh, to current identity issues. Next slide, please. So they're very diverse groups. Next slide, please, in the Caribbean. Uh, children play in diverse settings. So let me talk a little about this. Uh, to, the, to the left of your screen, these are kids playing on, on a beach in Jamaica, to Kingston. To the right, a child playing on a computer at a preschool program in the U.S. Next slide, please. This is a child uh, who plays outdoors a lot, likes to walk in, in river territories or small streams and collect um, little creatures from under the rocks, uh, um, among other things. So, next slide, please. Uh, play occurs within celebrations as well. These are children going to a Hindu function in Trinidad and Tobago, and they're well dressed up, but they played um, prior to this in their own groups, and they're gonna engage in some play and celebration uh, on stage. Uh, the other issue is that uh, with culture and play, the, the child has an open attention to the world. It has a wide angle. So the child not only plays, but repl replicates adult activities in play through uh, observation. And uh, the Paracana Indians in Brazil do this quite a bit, uh, where they observe and then replicate adult activities through mock warfare or hunting scenes and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, work is also mixed with play. Uh, this is one of my colleagues' work, colleagues' work in uh, Kenya. Uh, and children are collecting water, but they play on their way there. They play during uh, the collection of water. And so in a number of cultures, you have this balance between work and play. Next slide, please. Uh, the ecological niche matters. This is India, where play is occurring uh, within caregiving. So sibling care is um, high in a number of cultural communities and so you engage in play and caregiving together. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is Trinidad. We need to tap into the funds of knowledge of the cultural activities of communities. Uh, these children are dressed up uh, to go to Carnival, a yearly event in Port of Spain, Trinidad. Um, of course, Trinidad knows the land of the hummingbird. <laughs> no, that's okay, fine, thank you. Next slide, please. So we've used the UNICEF mixed data, and I presented some of these data to a group in England a few years ago, uh, where we study preschool children uh, from diverse ethnic backgrounds. Uh, so this study is based on data from Barbados, Belize, the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Guyana, and Suriname. And we are looking at parenting and literacy uh, skills among uh, preschool age children. Next slide, please. So there's some basic questions we ask. Do mothers fathers engage in play, in play, in play, book reading, storytelling with children across urban communities? And what are the associations between these activities and children's literacy skills? And I think this uh, is uh, related to the early preparation to school, um, how does play foster development as opposed to these other activities. And also there's quite a bit of storytelling going on um, in these communities. Uh, book reading, um, we'll see that the number of books in the homes um, predicts very well children's literacy skills. So in terms of intervention, we need, need to look at the number of lit literacy related materials in the home environment. So let's, next slide, please. So we looked at the UNICEF mix collected global indices, where the, the parents played with the child, read books to the child, and told children stories in the past three days. And they looked at whether children could identify or name at least 10 letters of the alphabet. The child can read at least four simple words. And the child knows the name, recognize symbols of letters, uh, numbers from one to 10. So we want to link these two sets of things. The, the sample size, uh, would you go back please? Yeah, yeah thanks, thank you. Um, so the sample size is a little smaller in Barbados, but it's respectable in the other countries. Next slide, please. So this is what we found in terms of reading books, telling stories, naming, counting, drawing. Uh, it's not surprising mothers uh, engage in quite a bit more than fathers. Um, 
these cultural communities have uh, different mating and parenting, I mean, uh, mating and marital patterns. A number of families engage in what you call progressive mating. So they have um, relationships in visiting unions and the fathers do not necessarily reside with the, the mother of the child. And then they move on to common law and so on. So th this affects, among other things, economic issues, uh, um, uh, they affect how uh, the level of father engagement with children. But by and large, uh, mothers do a lot more, and this is across the world, and we have found uh, many societies um, that where the, 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 the father exceeds the mother. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a play, singing songs and taking children outside. Again, you see the same pattern, mothers engaging quite a bit, but fathers, in terms of play, they're, they're doing a lot more in, in playing the child and in terms of taking the child outside. Okay, so how do you, how, what do we, do we find with respect to the relationship? Next slide, please. Uh, okay, anyway, this is their level of competence in um, the cognitive activities. Um, they are moderate, um, a little on the low side compared to other cultural communities, but similar to low-income families in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so across all Caribbean countries, I mentioned that uh, mothers engage in these activities more than fathers. Uh, the Dominican Republic and Suriname had the lowest levels of engagement um, in these activities. And with one exception, maternal play and paternal play did not show significant associations with children's literacy skills. And I know it's a little disappointing, but it, these are global indices. Next slide, please. Uh, what uh, surprises the children's age, preschool enrollment, and number of books in the home and household wealth were the most consistent predictors of children's literacy skills, uh, above and beyond um, book reading and, and, and so on. So, uh, but book reading did show promise in enhancing literacy skills more so than play. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the second study, we, this is a large data set from uh, 26 countries, close to 100 children, and we selected a subsample of children from uh, uh, a smaller number of countries. Uh, they are both low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. So this subsample includes 50,000 preschoolers from 18 countries, again, from diverse languages and cultural beliefs and practices and religions. Next slide, please. Uh, again, a similar pattern in the developing world, mothers engage in quite a bit more of play with children than fathers. It's towards the low end, but they're still playing with their children. What we did find in a study recently published in early education development is that allo caregivers, siblings, aunts, uncles, and others were the ones who were engaging a lot of play with children, and that predicted children's early competence and not the parents is so much. So in these societies that engage in allo caregiving or allo parenting, uh, we've often ignored these other caregivers who are um, engaged in early socialization and caregiving while parents go to work either foraging or uh, engaging in economic activities in the field. And uh, um, this can often present a distorted picture of play engagement on the part of parents. Next slide, please. So the same thing here, telling stories, again, mothers a lot more, nothing different. We included telling stories because in societies with long histories of oral traditions, we wanted to see whether telling stories would be linked to early literacy skills versus play and, and book reading. Next slide, please. So reading books, the same pattern, mothers more than fathers. And again, in some communities, cultural communities in the countries, I notice I use cultural communities within country because I'm, I want to avoid population level generalizations. So these samples are based on select communities within each country. Next slide, please. So I must have missed a slide. In, in the same pattern was true in terms of outcomes. Um, play did show a little more promise in, in being linked to children's literacy skills. Uh, but storytelling did not, book reading did. Now I want to end my talk by um, 
sharing data on a project in Jamaica that I was involved in. It's called the Roving Caregiver Program. It involves play, early children's life, uh, lives during the infancy period. Uh, and I will describe the program a little more to you, but High Scope has used play, Reg Amelia has, the Creative Curriculum, Bank Street, UE Preschool uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, Mixed Age programs, they've all emphasized play as central to the curriculum. And uh, this program, the next, next slide please. In Jamaica, what we did, this is a large um, pro program funded by the Bernard Van Lee Foundation, it's, it's a Dutch foundation. And it's been tested across the Caribbean. I was the consultant for the program. And we had high school graduates, uh, we call them roving caregivers. They were trained. Uh, they're also counselors who look at the difficulties children may have or distress. But they were largely trained to work with the families in their home environments, outdoors, uh, with play materials. And they, they were families who solicited or recruited during the uh, infancy period. And they were followed for uh, 18 months. And um, let me share some of the data. I, I don't have much time. So basically the program focused on increasing mother engagement, uh, maternal engagement, particularly when possible father engagement as well. And um, it, it focused on what cognitive and social activities, uh, bonding issues with, between parent and child. Okay, next slide please. So these are some of the activities, um, rope skipping, um, children engaging in group activities out, outside with prepared materials from the community. Uh, this, this program was culturally situated, culturally developmentally appropriate. We examined the toys and the materials for children as well as in, incorporated parental beliefs about play and early education. Next slide please. So more activities um, and the, the materials they were um, encouraged to, to use during play. Next slide, please. So the RCP is grounded in culturally relevant theoretical principles. So we use um, indigenous perspectives from the Caribbean uh, to build this program from the ground up. Uh, the family intervention was community-based and there was a strong community-based parent education component. And we focus on parent ma management techniques. Uh, we focus on health and safety issues and growth promoting child rearing practices. Uh, they, again, I said the parent child activities were culturally and developmentally appropriate. We made sure of that. Um, we also had mental health workers go to work with families and children. Next slide, please. So, what did we find after 18 months? There was a control group and an intervention group. And these are very low income families. This is the Griffiths. Um, after 18 months of intervention, you can see that the intervention group, the red line, they turn kind of health, they decrease a little, but look at the control group, the decline in 18 months in their overall developmental quotient. Next slide, please. Uh, hearing and speed subscale, again, the same pattern. Uh, they both declined, but the control group de declined quite a bit more significantly more. Next slide, please. And I subscale, the same thing. Um, pre post test, next slide, please. And the performance subscale, uh, if you're familiar with Griffiths, uh, these are some of the subscales. Uh, same pattern here. And uh, I must tell you, these kids are followed up to first, uh, what they call first standard, first grade. And the difference in intellectual scores, IQ scores and less scores, uh, was about a one and a half standard deviation above the mean. So the control group wasn't doing well. These kids are starting very poorly um, and perhaps they play assisted the other children. We hope so. Um, but this program has been extended to other uh, island nations as well. Uh, let me close here. I think I'm running out of time, Michael. Um, so, Play has tremendous benefit for children despite the, our data on play, uh, paternal play, maternal play, and child outcomes. But it, it's not uniformly demonstrated across cultures. Perhaps there are models of assessment, um, the types of um, activities that you're engaging. We are not tapping into that. Uh, we need to look at 
play in parenting programs in conjunction. Uh, those seem to boost cognitive development. And play works best in the context of re responsive parenting. This is a WHO goal, a World Health Organization goal. Um, and we have, um, we're conducting studies in Suriname, uh, Guyana, and Trinidad and Tobago and some of these issues, issues right now. So next slide, please. Uh, these are some resources. Um, I recently edited a, edited a book with, co-edited a book with Peter Smith from the University of London. It's a handbook on play. It might be useful to some of you. And uh, Michael and Jim and um, Suzanne, who was at Roehampton at the time, uh, we did a book on international perspectives on early childhood education. Uh, it incorporates play as well. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these are some of the resources. Next slide, please. <laughs> and these are, I want to leave you this image of some children in beautiful Jamaica, beautiful children in a beautiful setting with beautiful parents uh, playing outdoors. I thank you very much. I hope that wasn't too rushed.